negotiated by, at present, 13 countries, uh, including the United States, Japan, Malaysia, Australia, uh, and several other countries. Um, and these countries, of course, are uh, in uh, the Asia Pacific. Um, and importantly, this uh, is a very non-standard sort of trade agreement. Rather, is it a trade agreement? That's the question. It's called an economic framework, not a trade agreement. And the way they have structured this agreement is with four pillars. So the first pillar is the trade pillar. And interestingly, again, going back to commerce and diplomacy, these different pillars are being led by different parts of the administration. The trade pillar is being led by the USTR, which traditionally looks at trade agreements. The trade pillar is in fact aimed at expanding digital services trade. So this is the trade component of the agreement. What's interesting about digital services is that it doesn't entail tariffs. So whereas we, we typically think about trade agreements as lowering tariff rates, in this agreement on trade and expanding digital services trade, the issue is not tariffs. The issue is things like data localization, harmonizing standards, and data sharing. How do we make that happen? That's what this trade pillar is about. So I always find it interesting uh, looking at sort of what's in the popular press and the consternation about whether or not this is a trade agreement. And in my head I say, but it is a trade agreement. It's about digital services trade. Not because it doesn't include lowering of tariffs, it will include some expansion of trade. And if anyone follows uh, economic data, they know that expansion of digital services trade is where all the growth is in the global economy. We've sort of reached our peak in terms of where we can grow uh, in terms of making widgets. As one friend of mine recently said, widgets are one thing, but it's only a tiny part of the product these days. What's really important in the product are all the services that are surrounding the widgets. And that's what this digital services pillar is about. The second pillar is supply chains. We've all had this uh, experience in the, in the post-COVID world uh, in which supply chains experience some severe problems. So we're trying to learn from this experience and figure out how can we have a global economy where we're more resilient to supply shocks. So the instinct of policymakers is to over-regulate in these cases. And that's what happened a lot during the pandemic. Over-regulation exacerbated a lot of the supply chain challenges. So the idea of including supply chains in an economic framework is to have countries cooperate, coordinate on how they handle supply chain shocks that doesn't lead to overregulation when it actually does happen. So that's the supply chain pillar. The next pillar is the climate pillar or the clean economy pillar. I recently led a task force on climate and trade through my center and we presented our findings at COP26 last year in Glasgow. The main takeaway from this task force and our report is that we can no longer think about climate and trade inextricably. The only way to get progress on climate issues is to coordinate with trade policy. That's the only way. So it makes perfect sense to include a climate pillar in an economic framework of the 21st century. Now, this is usually something that gives economists heartburn, including climate issues in an economic framework, in a trade agreement. Why does it give economists heartburn? Because the usual approach to introducing climate into a trade agreement is to say, okay, you're not, uh, not upholding your climate promises, will impose a tariff on you. That's not what this is about at all. This is about coordinating domestic policies and international policies so that countries can figure out how to uh, achieve their shared climate objectives. 
That's what that's about. Now, the final uh, pillar, or rather, uh, yes, the final pillar is the fair trade pillar. Now, fair, fair trade or fair economy, what does that even mean? I was recently speaking to a former ambassador to Mexico, and he expressed great delight that uh, you know, fair trade was being considered in this agreement. Now the question is, fair for who? And I asked him that. I said, what does fair mean to you? And he said, manufacturing workers have been losing in the United States as a result of trade. That's true, that's an accurate statement. There are economic studies that show 10 years after China entered the WTO, average wages in the manufacturing sector declined by $550 annually. At the same time, annual average transfers to manufacturing workers increased by $50. If you're in the manufacturing sector and you saw what happened in China and what happened with trade with China, you're really pissed off. But let's take another step back. What share of the US labor force is manufacturing? 9%. What share of the US labor force is services? 40%. So when we talk about fair, we really have to look at the entire picture. We have to account for those who lose from trade, but we also have to keep it in perspective and not eliminate opportunities for those who might gain from trade. So one more thing to think about as we think about fair economy. Now we want to think also about our trading partners naturally. right? What does fair economy, clean economy, uh, supply chain, trade pillars mean for trading partners? This is not a one-way street. Now I really like the way that some of the language is written fair economy pillar. It's written to say that there should be upholding of rule of law, uh, expansion of regulations, not regulations that hurt, regulations that help, consistent regulations, having economies be more stable so that economies can grow. These are things that development economists have talked about for decades. These are just the usual things that economists say developing countries need. Now, you might say, okay, that's all imperialist uh, mumbo jumbo, right? Just a new way to do what the World Bank's been doing for a long time, apologies. Um, or is it, right? I think this is an opportunity to encourage our trading partners and to share what we know about institutions that work and of course some institutions that don't work. I think that's the objective there. And what about climate? One of the members of IPEF is Fiji. Fiji's kind of tiny. They're gonna disappear pretty soon if we don't do something about climate. For a country like Fiji, this is not about mitigation. This is about adaptation. And many developing countries, especially small island developing states, have been saying this for a long time. Yes, we need to do something about the actual climate, that's global warming and reduce emissions. I'm not a climate expert, so forgive me if I say anything that sounds silly. But there are countries that are suffering now. Not a future issue, they're suffering now and how do we address their needs. So when we have these discussions about climate, it's much more for these countries about what do we do right now to adapt to what's going on. And by the way, this helps advanced countries too. We have studies that show that climate shocks in developing countries can transmit to markets in advanced countries. For example, a typhoon or a hurricane, I'm not sure what the right word is, in Vietnam can transmit 
to Wall Street into negative uh, returns. We have evidence of that. So this is really about our shared interest and destiny. So I'm gonna leave that there. Um, apologies if I took too long. Um, because we have lots to talk about. So the first question um, I'd like to address, again, is about this lack of what they call market access or lowering towers. And this is the main critique so far of the Indo-Pacific economic framework. So I'd like to turn to our distinguished guests right now and ask them their thoughts on this. Um, and I'll start with, of course, uh, Consul General uh, Sonia King. Thank you so much, and please give us your thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Kenko Sone. Uh, Sone is my first name. I mean, nowadays, Japan I start uh, uh, you know, saying my name, uh, names starting with your family name. So we uh, tend to use Sone as uh, first. Sone Kenko Sone is my uh, family name. So, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, arranging this uh, uh, meeting. Conference and then I'm very much looking forward to having a good discussion. And the, at the outset, I just would like to congratulate the Malaysian government to completing their process, domestic process, to uh, to join the TPP, uh, CPTPP. Uh, so they, uh, the agreement will be in effective uh, in end of November. So this the uh, you know we are now in the eleven countries supposed to be. So the uh, nation uh, come uh, ninth uh, uh, partner to join the uh, CPTPP, and we are still waiting two more to come in. And I also have some in my mind. We need some other countries to also <laughs> come in back. <laughs> uh, so well, uh, well, yes. Uh, so the uh, IPEF, well, it's uh, uh, a very uh, interesting initiative. As you mentioned, that this doesn't have a market access pillar. Uh, well, um, I've been somehow uh, dealing with trade issues in the foreign ministry. Uh, I spent more than 30 years in the foreign ministry uh, diplomacy, uh, but maybe more than half of my career is uh, working on the foreign issues. So um, it's, I'm a kind of person who has been demonstrating the, uh, what uh, economic diplomacy or what the commerce diplomacy. Means so it really works, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think the uh, the of course you know when my, uh, I've been really dealing with trade negotiation like in WTO and the market access is is of course it's a very important pillar, and uh, we are really working really hard uh, to get the market access issues, but it's always a difficult one, and as you can see in our uh, negotiation, I was involved in the uh, so-called Doha round. Still, the people remember that. <laughs> but the, the main, main pillar is, of course, the market access, and we have to, to, to negotiate among those um, uh, 190 countries to agree on. And but it, it, it failed. Uh, but I think it, well, it, you know, the, the most of the developed countries, maybe the, the, the tariff is already getting really low, and you also have to think about. Uh, other than tariffs, there are so many issues that will, uh, you know, prevent the trade or the investment. Uh, those are the uh, regulations or the rules that the, each country has to copy. So that the the, uh, the currently most of the trade agreement covers so many different areas like the uh, the, the rules and the procedures, the trade facilitation, uh, those type of things. Uh, in, in that sense, those uh, 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 rules or standards is getting more important uh, to enhancing the trade. Uh, so in, in that sense, even this uh, uh, IPEC doesn't have uh, the uh, market access pillars, but the, once we are really working hard for harmonizing the rules or regulations or the creating a high standard uh, uh, procedures, I think that very uh, eventually benefit uh, increasing the trade, also the uh, investment. Uh, I think in that sense, the uh, IPEC is very unique, and especially uh, if you see this uh, situation after the COVID and the, uh, the, the, this crisis in Ukraine, we have so many uh, new issues that we have to tackle, like the, as you mentioned, 
the supply chain issues. You know, when we have a, normally having the low trade negotiation with the past, we never think about the, you know, that the supply chain issue will be uh, a real problem for the trade or the economic, global economic issues. So this is the market uh, supply chain is one of the very important aspects that we have to tackle. And uh, the, the clean economy, of course, we've been start uh, dealing with uh, uh, the climate change issues in the trade, but we are still uh, struggling what will be the best way to promote uh, uh, to, to, to uh, prevent the, uh, uh, the climate change disasters. Uh, one thing I have done in the past in the uh, WTO negotiation, we've been uh, uh, creating some uh, group for negotiation, negotiating the uh, environmental goods. Uh, so reducing the tariffs for the environmental goods is one way we try to achieve that goal, but it may not really be a, a, a final solution at this moment. But they, uh, I think those uh, the climate change related or clean economy is also another very important issue we have to tackle. So uh, at this moment, we are not sure what uh, the results of this negotiation are going to be, but still, the, the important thing that we have been really uh, identify those issues, and then we have been tackling, and to, to create, we need some really uh, innovative solutions to deal with those issues. So I, I think that sense probably is a uh, bit, I, I think it's really important to, to, uh, to proceed. Thank you, Sony. Uh, so, Council General, uh, uh, Marisa. Now, do we go by Anil? Anil. Anil, that's great. <laughs> okay, please tell us uh, from Malaysia's perspective uh, about it. All right, thank you. Um, well, again, first of all, thank you uh, for pressing the Council for the invitation and for hosting such a very meaningful event. Uh, it gives the opportunity for countries, small countries like Malaysia, for example, to state our position on matters that are important. So thank you very much. Um, uh, I do apologize, you know, I have been a diplomat um, and I've been doing political diplomats, uh, diplomacy um, ever since I joined the service 18 years ago. I'm no expert in economy, but of course, you know, diplomats, you can talk about everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, regarding IPAD, you know, you mentioned that it has no market access. But then, um, how relevant it is that, you know, it is a framework, it's not yet an agreement, there's no signing um, yet, right? Uh, but we f for Malaysia, that is what appeals us. Because IPAD is unique in a sense. It's different from the other FTAs. Malaysia, for example, we already have 16 FTAs. That's seven bilateral and, I'm sorry, my maths is spelling me right now. <laughs> but the, the remaining are the regional FTAs. And as um, now, the Consul General has mentioned that every FTAs, every regional FTAs that we have, they're very specific, um, very technical um, oriented. And we see that IPAD is um, the ones that are very much updated to the needs of the current situation. So, for example, um, we talk about market access in all other FTAs, correct? We talk about it in, as well as in WTO and the Roha Roundtable. Now, that makes the IPAD unique you know, because it concentrates on the uh, most important thing uh, that's happening now, the supply chain resilience, the green economy, the clean economy, and then we're talking about the tax, right? the fair economy. Uh, those FTAs, uh, those um, topics are not necessarily being discussed, with agreed in the past FTAs. And for us, you know, um, for developing countries like Indonesia, you know, um, IPAF, provides us the opportunity to forge closer economic ties between the developed and the developing countries. We see that the diverse um, economic um, partners um, in IPAF, and we're very happy that we have US um, in, in, in this framework, because for Malaysia, um, we, we do not have FTA with um, the US, and uh, so far we have not any we do not have any channel of communication when it comes to uh, trade agreements with the US. So for us, IPAF, even though it doesn't not it does not have the market access discussion at the moment, it is very important 
it is very relevant to Malaysia. And I, I, I think I can say that to many developing countries um, on this regard. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, so, uh, Consul General, uh, Ambassador rather, Jane Duke from Australia couldn't join us this morning, um, uh, but she, she really did want to join us this morning. So she did uh, send some thoughts, um, and I'll, I'll read these. So we know sort of uh, a, another perspective on IPAF. Uh, so they first wanted to, she wanted to express Australia's strong support for IPAF. Um, they see it as important to strengthening economic engagement across the Indo-Pacific and being able to bring together some of the largest and most dynamic regional economies. So I didn't mention that IPEF represents 40% of global GDP, so this is not a small agreement. Um, it, it also involves eight of Australia's top 10 uh, merchandise trading partners, so even though it does not involve market access, there is a lot of opportunity to coordinate on merchandise trade. Um, uh, for them, addressing themes like digital economy, supply chains, clean energy, infrastructure, anti-corruption uh, is really important. Um, and it's really addressing contemporary challenges. Um, they're really uh, uh, excited about the opportunity to increase cooperation and integration across the region. So I just wanted to pause because um, you know uh, these statements really uh, highlighted the fact that it's not a trade agreement. It's not, I, I say it's not your grandmother's trade agreement. Mm -hmm. um, I do really appreciate your statement that a lot of the, 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 the things that sort of get tacked on at the end of a trade agreement, so climate and um, you know, labor standards, you know, some discussion of that, they're, they're usually an add-on. But in this particular framework, they're actually front and center. So, you know, we sort of painted a rosy picture of, of the Indo-Pacific economic framework, but maybe there are uh, some real challenges uh, that we have to account for. And uh, one of these challenges we already know about, for example, uh, Korea is part of the Indo-Pacific economic framework, and we know that uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there are massive subsidies for electronic vehicle batteries. This is not really helpful to our trading partner. So what does an agreement like IPEF have to say about that? So there are still challenges, um, but hopefully through discussions with our trading partners, uh, we're gonna get to um, a, a different outcome. So what I'd like to do now is open up uh, for possible questions from the audience. Um, you know, we, we'll do our best uh, to uh, answer what we can. Um, and I believe there's a microphone going around. So um, we will uh, get that microphone to whoever has a question. Um, and if you don't mind, as you ask the question, just say your name and your affiliation so we sort of orient ourselves. Thank you. I'm Richard Downey from the World Affairs Council of Orange County. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Um, I had a question on the relationship that you have economically with China. And, you know, for a while, China was really forceful in their relationships, this sort of wolf warrior diplomacy, and it didn't seem to work. And I wonder now how you're feeling, I don't know if they've They've learned from that and pushed back a bit, uh, or if they are continuing to be very forceful in their economic relationships with, uh, with countries in your area. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that relationship now. Thank you. So I'd ask you both to uh, provide a, a thought on that, if you would. Well, it's, you know, we are, Japan is really a uh, living next to China. <laughs> we can separate ge ge geologically. Uh, so anyway, we have to deal with them. Uh, well, I've been uh, dealing with China in the past, uh, but that was in uh, around the year 2000, which the time which we rather have uh, better relations. 
I think they, they, from the economic uh, uh, perspective, you know, after uh, China joined the uh, WTO, we are expecting China to be playing a very important role in the international trade and economy. Uh, well, uh, they are doing to a certain extent, but the problem is that they, what they are really doing sometimes, oh, we can not see how they really implemented those uh, agreements or not. Uh, they have so many, you know, government affiliated organization enterprises and how their the action is is commercially oriented or the government decide. Uh, uh, those are things that we like to, to tackle uh, to deal with China. Well uh, you know we Japan have so many investments in China. Uh, Japanese company have uh, the you know, factories and relations uh, it maybe it's really difficult to decouple everything. But the uh, certain aspect we are now talking about the uh, economic security. So a uh, certain uh, high technologies, maybe we have to be careful about uh, dealing with uh, uh, those you know, uh, new technologies, how we deal with Chinese. But at least we, for, for directly dealing with China, we have to, uh, to, 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 to push or urge them to uh, implementing uh, the agreement, whatever really uh, based on I, I don't have a character. I, I, I we are always trying them to implement the agreement as we really agree and we need more uh, mechanism to check uh, those things. Uh, that, that is uh, uh, things we would like to do. Uh, I, I just stopped here. Thank you. <laughs> to that. Um, all right. Um, and um, I do have experience with China too. You know, I was a guest officer for China for about four or five years. Um, and then uh, to answer your question, um, China is our very important uh, economic partner for Malaysia. It's number one uh, trading partner of Malaysia. It's um, number one for the investment it comes to manufacturing for 30 to 40 years or so. So um, our relationship when it comes to um, economy, um, trading, um, very, very important, okay? Um, and then uh, I must say that Malaysia is a trading nation. So we establish our economic relations with um, many countries, um, that's including um, the IFF partners and um, also China. Well, um, our relationship actually goes beyond um, the economic perspective. You know, it started many, many years ago. Um, if you go back to the history, it even started maybe about 500 years ago. So our relationship with China are very close, perhaps not as close as Japan, whereby we're also geographically close. Um, but um, if we have the history in China, the cultural um, aspect of it. Now, when it comes to the economy, of course, you know, when you have uh, a long history, there tend to be some mm, I don't know, issues, uh, uh, some, some, some things that you don't see eye to eye, or as uh, Kosa Jo mentioned, that um, there have been agreements that maybe perhaps a different interpretation, interpretations, whatever. But the way how Malaysia would normally deal with this, and particularly with China, is that we would engage them um, bilaterally. You know? um, so we would, uh, we, we had some issues before, I don't know whether you're aware, um, that uh, some of the projects um, of China in Malaysia, uh, but those are the things that Malaysia, we would discuss it separately and bilaterally with um, China. And so far, it has been working for us. So, things are quite okay for Malaysia and China. <laughs> Thank you for those comments. Um, so, I, I uh, wanted to sort of raise the fact that Canada uh, just announced the uh, intent to bid to join IPEF. Um, so, this is a sort of puts an interesting spin on things because Canada is also one of the countries. Uh, that's part of the CPTPP, Comprehensive Partnership 
uh, for uh, what is it that we are talking about about TPP? Uh, comprehensive Trans Pacific Partnership or something like this. All these name acronyms. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so sort of going back to this discussion of China, I know China has also expressed interest in joining CPTPP, um, and so this uh, sense of a really interesting, uh, I would say, dynamic uh, between countries that are part of CPTPP and countries that are part of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. I could keep talking, so but I won't. So let me uh, let me go to one more question from the audience. I'm just going to leave that hanging out there. Good morning, my name is Alex Parker. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. It was a very interesting topic. Um, I said I heard about the framework, but I wasn't too aware of what was going on in it. One of my questions here, recently the Biden administration announced uh, some export controls around advanced US semiconductors, and part of what I've heard as concern from the American business community is we're also losing access to the Chinese market and their customers. How would we be able to leverage the Indo-Pacific economic framework to kind of help fill the gap of us cutting the uh, potential, the potential or future potential decouplings of China. So I'll just say two things on that and then turn it over to my colleagues here. Uh, so I was recently in a, a session with some business folks and they said the right thing. They said boring is good <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to policy. This sort of echoes some of the statements you made. Um, surprises are bad. Uh, if there's an agreement or an, an arrangement that you expect to uh, go in a particular direction and it doesn't go in the direction you expect, that is just bad for business. Um, export controls obviously came as a surprise, but I think many things are coming as a surprise with regards to the relationship with China. And I, I would expect the surprises to keep coming. Um, so in terms of an agreement like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, I think that's one of the things uh, this is intended to mitigate, having a group of countries where there are fewer surprises. Um, transparency is a word that comes up a lot in the, the, the uh, documents for the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, so uh, I, will, I will turn it over to you for some thoughts on that. So um, I, I think it is um, a lot of opportunities, you know, um, for um, IPF uh, partners. Um, whenever um, what, whatever that's happening uh, between the U.S. and um, China, you know, there is this Chinese saying that um, whenever there's a, a crisis, there's also opportunity. You know, um, uh, in, in this regard. Um, I would like to just um, highlight uh, what my uh, Minister of Trade and Investment um, said during the recent uh, ministerial meeting um, of IPEF that was um, in September, just last month, right? So um, he also talked about that, you know, about the semiconductor um, uh, resilience. Um, and then, um, you know, he also highlighted that perhaps you know, the recently uh, concluded the memorandum of um, cooperation between Malaysia and the US on, uh, was, let me just make sure that I get it right, so semiconductor supply chain resilience can be incorporated, the model can be um, included um, in the IPAF. So that is, you know, that, that just gives you an example of what we can do in ICAF, right? Like we have some concerns, some issues, and then we can address it um, bilaterally, and we can, we can expand in a regional framework. So that is the positive um, perspective um, of the framework. So, yeah. Well, uh, the uh, you know the semiconductors is getting the really, um, huge uh, demands in the world. <coughs> so I uh, the other day I visited the Phoenix, Arizona, uh, see some uh, big factories uh, currently you know developed by TCMC and also our Intel factory as well. It's in the uh, world Japan still have a very good uh, suppliers the uh, equipment. Although we are, we are not really producing the uh, uh, good 
semiconductors and the Japanese companies. Uh, but still, we have uh, those uh, many suppliers who uh, are maybe uh, number one in the world. So we have been really working hard to, to, uh, to cooperate with the US and other uh, like minded countries. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, we, we, as I mentioned, that we, we are uh, trying to create the high standard rules which can apply to as many countries as possible. And then uh, those agreements, uh, the, the standards will uh, eventually uh, apply. Any, once any countries who can really meet those standards, they, they can join in uh, the agreement for the, the, the uh, partners. Uh, like in the CPTPP, well, Chinese are interested in joining. Well, of course, it's the CPTPP is open to any countries, it's inclusive. Uh, but the, the, there is a condition that they have to meet all the standards and that we have no compromise in any standards. So I, I think that we have to stick on that part. And I don't know eventually how Chinese will react in those, uh, those situations, whether they are really uh, accommodating uh, uh, our way of doing business or we are there going their own directions. But the, our aim is to create the, uh, the, the uh, standard or uh, the rules which can apply as many countries as possible. I think that is uh, the notion or the uh, aim that we are trying to do in the uh, IPF as well. Thank you. I think we have uh, maybe time for just one more question. Um, thank you. I am Victoria Chanchi. I'm a political economist from uh, the University of Southern California. So, first of all, thank you, Dr. Bowen, for clarifying that IPEF is not a trade agreement. Um, however, as a political economist, of course, I think about the long term and the geopolitical effects of these kind of agreements and frameworks. So, my question, I guess, is how do you see the role of IPEF vis-a-vis right with CPTP and even RCEP? Do you see it more as complementary or do you see the potential of being competing, I guess, uh, frameworks, at least from the perspective, the geopolitical perspective, I could see how IPEF could strengthen some of the political alliances, right? And yet, uh, we see China wanting to get into CPTP, so I'm just curious about, from your experience and what you might see in the future, whether or not there is a complementary role or competing role. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, I will turn this over to my colleagues to answer that. They're, they're the ones who, who know the answer. Uh, well, um, Thank you answer, for that answer. That was a great answer. Because my answer is uh, it's all complimentary. Uh. Very diplomatic. Very diplomatic. Thank you. But I, I think you know that. Uh, as you mentioned, that there are so many trade agreements. Uh, Japan also joins so many different kind of trade agreements, and it creates some difficulty for the business people to which agreement they are going to to use uh, for exporting the products or investing. It makes uh, so so much complications. So the person who have been involved in the WTO, it's the, of course the best way is to agree among everybody. So the tariffs will be applied to everybody the same way. This will be the very, uh, you know, the dream world, uh, which never happened in the past and maybe not in the, in the, in the future. But I think it's it, we are, you know, creating some the uh, various agreement. Uh, but the, the the purpose or the uh, aim is to try to get as high start as possible, so that that will become. Uh, sort of the model for any agreement. I think uh, CPTPP one example, and you know the Japan and US also have the agreement about the uh, digital trade, uh, which is also another high standard agreement in the digital. So I we hope the uh, IPEF is also is a forum framework which can really uh, set the high standard so, so that there be countries who try to uh, to go to that direction. Of course, some developing countries have some difficulty to achieve that uh, goal. Maybe we have some mechanism. We should create some mechanism to support our cooperation and assistance, technical assistance, to to encourage them to 
we're going up the study the tactic. Those are the uh, the, uh, the predicate we are trying to achieve. Okay, and I say it with, with conviction that it is complementary. Okay? Um, it is not meant to be uh, for competition because um, I mentioned this now. Uh, Malaysia, we have 16 FTAs. No? We have the bilateral, we have regionals, we have with um, ASEAN uh, FTAs, ASEAN plus um, Japan. Um, we have um, the CPTPP which will enter into force in November. We have the RCEP. No? It's a long list of the FTAs. But you know, I guess the question is that what is the purpose of these FTAs? What is the purpose of this agreement? Okay? The purpose of having all these FTAs, FTA agreements, is for the prosperity, for the economic resilience, um, for the stability of whatever between region uh, or the partners of that framework. You know? It's always positive. It's never negative. So I would say it is complementary. And I ask the same question too. You know, it's like why why is um um I call it IPAF is different than CPTPP? How is it different from RCEP? You know, I did my homework too, you know. But as you mentioned that um you know um, this is the one that US is involved with, right? Finally, I mean I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> is involved and for us Malaysia is something that's you know, interesting you know? of course we have uh, we like to work with other countries too but this gives us the avenue to work with the US because in the past we do not have that okay um, of course you know, we have Japan um, we have ROK we have India uh, uh, those, so, so, so different framework different FTAs different whatever you call it, right? Um, it serves um, different, uh, perhaps it's different, it serves the common goal or objectives in economy, uh, but it's a different group. So that actually gives us the benefit to work with different regions, right? Um, and then uh, if I can just throw some facts, you know, like for um, IPAF, it's, uh, it would serve 40% of the GDP, and um, it's going to be the biggest among all. Um, I, I have it here. If I don't, you don't mind to mention it. Um, and then forty percent, forty nations, and two point five billion population. And our set is fifty nations, but it's only thirty percent of GDP. Um, and then it does not, uh, it doesn't involve US, it does not involve India, it does not involve Fiji. And in terms of population, it's only 2.2 billion. It's smaller than IPAC. Uh, CPTPP, on the hand, is at 11 nations, um, and it's 13.4% of GDP. So, you no, know, that's how we see that how these different frameworks, different agreements, can actually complement and can be mutually beneficial to countries that are partners to it. So, again, I would say that um, it is complementary. Um, it is not uh, for competition. Thank you. Yes. I, I just would like to add one thing that one uh, unique or uh, one important aspect of the IPEF is that we are participation of the media. I have to think about my friend's face. Uh, but I mean, I mean also put a post in the media, an engine is a really a big market area, but it's going to be the, uh, well, uh, sooner or later it will be a capacity of China. And it's a democracy. And then uh, I think uh, well, the, uh, uh, well, we are always trying to India to participate in their various uh, well, economic agreement. Sometimes they are uh, difficult to deal, but I think this time with India is on board, and uh, it's a really important uh, aspect of the uniqueness of the uh, IFTEC as, as well. I just like that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. These are some great questions. Uh, I'll add my final thoughts uh, since you're an academic from one academic to another. Uh, so I do study trade agreements and the uh, purpose of trade agreements is to expand uh, uh, economic, uh, you know, grow the pie basically. Um, and we do have some work by economists, uh, one of my colleagues, Kyle Handley, 
that shows one of the main benefits of trade agreements is not even so much of lowering tariffs or trade barriers, but it's actually the uncertainty that's reduced as a result of these agreements. And so as we're thinking about whether these things are complementary or uh, whether they're competition, I, I don't, I'm not so sure that's the right question. I think uh, the objective is to expand these agreements as much as possible, but even in expanding these agreements, the, 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 the main uh, feature or one of the benefits is having a predictable and stable agreement. And when uh, there are challenges with understanding where a particular member country is heading, uh, that makes it really challenging to include that member country in an agreement. So, uh, you know, as, uh, as Sonia has said, I, uh, the, the purpose of this agreement is to continually increase standards um, that can increase prosperity for all the member countries. My understanding is that it's open to all member countries. Um, and as long as countries are willing to abide by the agreement and, um, uh, and uh, have some amount of predictability and transparency, uh, I think it should be um, uh, uh, pretty much uh, anyone can join. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let me just wrap up and thank everyone here so much. Uh, thank you for your great questions, by the way. Um, I also uh, have been told to preview what's coming next. Uh, TED Style Talks, and this is, uh, if you thought I was young, this is how you know I'm not young. <laughs> Featuring field notes from Samantha Nutt, who's a pediatrician and nonprofit CEO. Um, that sounds really fascinating. I want to see that. Uh, Marcus Yam, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, and Agnia Briga, scholar and Russian Ukraine specialist. Oh my goodness, uh, you guys sound like you're in for a treat today. Um, so, with that, I would like to really thank our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and thanks to everyone.